Questions to the Prime Minister, Dr. Charles Goodson Wicks. I have been asked to reply. My right honourable friend, the Prime Minister, is attending the commemorations for the 50th anniversary of the United Nations in New York. Would my right honourable friend uh, join me in welcoming yet another fall in the unemployment figures, yeah. which are now below even those of Germany for the first time in recent years? Isn't this a, a resounding vindication of the government's policies? Yeah. And, and isn't it about time that the party opposite explained how a minimum wage is going to help young people get jobs? My honourable friend is absolutely right. The latest unemployment figures are quite excellent. And I think he raises a very important point in the direction of the House towards the minimum wage. I did notice that the Right Honourable Gentleman, the Deputy Leader of the Opposition, said some party colleagues have advocated such a wage without having the courage of their convictions to state an amount that would make the commitment meaningful. Would the Deputy Leader of the Labour Party now break the habit of his party and answer the question, what is the figure that would give meaning to the policy? Yeah. Madam Deputy Speaker, this is an historic moment. May I welcome the Right Honourable Gentleman to his first Prime Minister's questions. It's been a long time, but he's finally made it. <laughs> given, <laughs> given Given, given the Prime Minister's belated but welcome concern with waste and mismanagement abroad, can we now expect him to show the same concern for waste and mismanagement at home? Can he tell us how much money was wasted on the poll tax, how much money was wasted on the new bureaucracy in the health service, and while he's at it, can he tell us how much it costs to set up and run his own new empire? I'm most grateful to the uh, Right Honourable Gentleman for uh, his welcome to uh, my position at the dispatch box today. And of course I reciprocate in welcoming him to the position he holds. But I can't help but notice, whilst the uh, uh, Prime Minister, my Right Honourable Friend, has trusted me to come alone, the Right Honourable Gentleman has had a minder appointed to look after him. <laughs> But the curiosity of the minder is that he hasn't even had the courage to turn up in order to help with the minding process. <laughs> but the Right Honourable Gentleman knows full well. The Right Honourable Gentleman knows full well. <clears throat> do, I, do I gather that the Honourable Member for Hartlepools has crossed the floor and is now sitting on this side of the house? Or is it he's scouring away in the basement somewhere? relaying what is going on in this House to the leader of the Labour Party, who of course will never be able to get a first-hand account from the Deputy Leader because they don't talk. But it really is ridiculous, Madam Speaker. Oh, oh, order, 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 order. This is very time-consuming. I want brief, I want brief questions and brief answers. Madam, Madam Speaker, I think we'll get a brief answer because the Honourable Member for Hartlepools has now turned up. Since the Right Honourable Gentleman isn't able to give us a proper answer, can I help him? On the Government's own figures, £14 billion was wasted on poll tax, £1 billion was wasted on the new bureaucracy in the health service, and isn't the real truth that the government's press and publicity machine costs the taxpayer £1 million every working day? Oh. 
Isn't the real cost to the isn't that the real cost to the country of the right honourable gentleman's new title? And isn't it clear that something that's so expensive to sell must be a pretty shabby product? The right honourable gentleman will know when we've got as many good policies as we've got, it's our duty to draw them to the attention of the people who benefit from them. And the first thing we have an obligation to do is to point out that for every pound spent on the health service in 1978-9, we spent five pounds last year. Sir Michael Shearsby. Two, madam. I refer my honourable friend to the reply I gave some moments ago. Sir Michael Shearsby. Will my right honourable friend, the Deputy Prime Minister? Order, order. The honourable gentleman will resume his seat. <laughs> yes, Sir Will Michael. My right honourable friend, the Deputy Prime Minister, join me in congratulating the BBC and Channel 4 in transmitting live the whole of last week's debate on the yeah. prison service. Yeah. Does he agree with me that that provided viewers with the opportunity to see my right honourable and learned friend, the Home Secretary, demolish the unworthy and unsuccessful yeah. attempt? The I'm most grateful to my uh, honourable friend. I think it was quite excellent that the House and a wider public had the chance to see the vacuum that lies behind Labour allegations last night, and also the chance to hear the quite excellent speech of my right honourable friend, the Home Secretary. But I must say this to the BBC, if they go on showing the opposition in the light they did, it won't be Alistair Campbell that rings up to complain, it'll be the League Against Cruel Sports. Miss <laughs> Liz Lynn, no. Question three, Madam Speaker. Please <laughs> call question three. I refer the Honourable Lady to the reply I gave some moments ago. Lynn? Is the Deputy um, Prime Minister aware that Rochdale Health Authority, due to financial constraints, is proposing that elderly, critically ill patients should not be allowed into nursing homes funded by the NHS unless they're going to die within four weeks? Does he not accept that this is the ultimate responsibility of the government? Yeah. Yeah. It is the ultimate responsibility of the government to provide the excellent health service that it does. I would, be, I, would be, I, I would not be prepared to stand at this dispatch box with the sort of case which the Honourable Lady puts to me without the chance to examine it further in detail. But the fact of the matter is that the health service is attracting increasing funds and the results are increasingly attractive to the public. In fact, uh, public assessment of the health service's quality is rising consistently. Peter Brook. Man Madam Speaker, uh, after the warm-up bout last week, could my right honourable friend ar arrange, in the manner of the Ryder and Walker Cups, a series of singles matches between the, the Cabinet and their opposite numbers? <laughs> not, 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 not least so that we can see if the captain of the other side, in a manner unusual in international golf, continues to intervene to help his honourable friends out of fun. <laughs> Well, my right honourable friend is a past master at coming to the heart of the matter, but I suspect that the leader of the opposition will not want to reveal his shadow cabinet uh, too conspicuously because self-evidently the parliamentary party has elected a shadow cabinet in the diametrically opposite direction the leader wants to go. Mr Ken Purchase. I refer the honourable gentleman to the reply I gave some moments ago. Purchase. Does the Deputy Prime Minister yeah, recognise yeah. that investment in manufacturing is now lower than it was six years ago, despite a recent, and I must say, welcome improvement? And does he accept that this lack of investment, widely acknowledged as a British problem, uh, is directly responsible for the loss of 520 jobs in my constituency at the British steel plant, which produces specialist seamless tubes and the only supplier in the UK. Will he undertake to intervene, preferably before breakfast, and ask for a rethink on this closure, or does he recognise that if it closes we shall have an even bigger uh, balance of uh, trade problem than we have presently? Yeah. 
whatever I think that the Honourable Member might help his constituency if he got up earlier in the morning himself and he would discover that unemployment in his constituency has dropped by 30% in the last two and a half years. conference a month ago at the General Assembly in New York, which unanimously agreed that the problems of the United Nations are our problems, and that if we did not have the organization, we would have to invent it. My honorable friend, of course, has made a most valuable contribution to this whole subject, particularly to the work of the IPU, and the whole House is indebted to him for that. But our position as a country in support of the United Nations is second to none. But that is no justification for that organization wasting money or not collecting its proper dues. Margaret Hodge. Number five, Madam Speaker. I refer the Honourable Lady to the reply I gave some moments ago. Mrs Hodge. We seem to have some difficulty, Madam Speaker, in eliciting direct answers from uh, the Deputy Prime Minister. Will he, will he in following what my Honourable Friend has in an article in The Independent yesterday, it was asserted that the Deputy Prime Minister had spent £80,000 of public money on a desk dance. Oh, oh. Did, did the Deputy Prime Minister receive permission from the Prime Minister to spend this money in such an extravagant manner? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, the Honourable Lady will find, if she relies on the national press for the basis of her research, that she's consistently wrong-footed. I have spent no money on a desk. But the fact of the matter is, what she would be much better employed doing is praising the government which has presided over a reduction of 22% in unemployment in her constituency. This is Theresa Gorman. I... I... Re- I refer order, my order. honourable friend. This, order. this House will come to order. I want to hear the answers to these questions, whether the House does or not. Deputy Pro- Order! 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 Now, do be quiet. Prime Minister. I refer my honourable friend to the reply I gave some moments ago. Storm. Right honourable a friend, aware that no less a luminary than the director of the Fabian Society has come out in support of grant maintained schools. <laughs> Much to the relief of the leader of the opposition, whose own party, of course, have been opposing him on this sensible gesture. Can we now count, with almost uh, cross-party support on this matter, on seeing our government proceed with all speed to making all our schools yeah. grow yeah. yeah. thus bringing to every parent the choice of a school which they actually would like to send their children to? Yeah. Yeah. My honourable friend is absolutely right to draw the attention of the House to this critical matter. Of course, the fact is that all the Fabian Society are doing in putting forward this proposal is once again looking to the Conservatives for the ideas which are taking us forward into the next century. And the whole House will know that for all the rhetoric of the left, what they're really about is abolishing grant-maintained schools, abolishing grammar schools, abolishing city technology colleges, and abolishing simple performance tables and simple tests in everything all for dogma and rhetoric and nothing for quality in education. George Fawkes. Madam Speaker, doesn't the Deputy Prime Minister realise that all this knockabout opposite will be... will be taken... Order! will be taken very badly by starving millions in the third world, already, already fearful of the proposed of the proposed cuts and now and they're laughing opposite madam speaker as usual and yet now we have the prime minister at the united nations talking about abolishing unesco the food and agriculture organization and the ilo this will go down extremely badly because they all know that like the cuts in overseas aid they are to fund the pre-election 
tax cut bribes of the Tories opposite. Did, did I hear the Honourable Member refer to knockabout opposition when he first intervened? Well, it cannot be explained, Madam Speaker, in any other language. This country has the fifth largest aid programme in the world. How can the party opposite decry that? And when you actually add to that our inward investment in other people's countries and the remarkable contribution we make to peacekeeping, one has just one further example. Is that whatever this country does, the party opposite seek to decry and destroy. Question seven, I refer my honourable friend to the reply I gave some moments ago. Bruce, Madam Speaker, does my right honourable friend welcome the uh, protestations that we've had, particularly from parties opposite, that we are all in favour in this House of increasing investment in our railways? Does he believe that uh, those protestations uh, are consistent with uh, first the Leader of the Opposition suggesting that uh, uh, the railways would be re-nationalised and then the new uh, shadow uh, spokesman for that department saying that she wouldn't pay for it? Well, I think the whole House is interested in what my honourable friend has to say, but it's also interested in what the Deputy Leader of the Labour Party has to say to the union that sponsors him. Uh, is he in favour of them taking strike action and imposing hardship on very large numbers of Londoners trying to get to work? Is he or is he not in support of that? Thank you. Time's up. Mr Anne Coffey. Order. Would you wait a moment until the house is cleared? I can't hear the honourable gentleman, and I hope it's not a bogus one. All right, let me hear it. You've got a good voice. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Is it an order for another member of this house to advertise members' surgeries in my constituency, seeking contact with my constituents? In seeking your advice, Madam Speaker, I add that my constituents will be excluded from my constituency following boundary, boundary changes at the next general election. But it is my belief, Madam Speaker, that it is my duty to represent my constituents up until that time, and no other member should intervene. The Honourable Gentleman is perfectly correct. Until the next general election, whether he has boundary changes or not, as I do myself, I still represent the people who put me here from West Bromwich West. The Honourable Gentleman would like to let me see the advertisement. I'll be glad to deal with it. Now, may I have Miss Anne Coffey? I'd beg the leave of the House to introduce this bill, which would enable voluntary and independent fostering agencies to improve their own foster carers 